Uh, okay, so I'm Eleanor. Uh, thank you all for coming out today. I also wanted to give uh, a special thank you um, to my colleagues, uh, Lucasa, Juliana, and Katerina, and also um, to the faculty members of PAPR and other faculty members who um, have helped me along at my time here at VCU. Um, my presentation will be sort of a general overview of my time here um, and how I've accumulated um, work into my thesis show. So I want to start with this image. Um, this is an image that my mother brought from Iran. It's an image of a Sufi saint. Um, and I bring it up because it's probably the image that I've looked at the most and have studied the most. Um, this, this Sufi saint, his face is sort of anonymous and the artist is anonymous as well. Um, but it, it, prevent, it presents a man's face with animals and other people and birds um, all making up his features. And so for me, this image um, has always served as sort of a metaphor of how we become part of landscape, we become part of each other, and we're in this constant um, shifting between um, bodies throughout time. And it's also very interesting to me in that it's an image within an image. Um, and so beginning with my works that I started VCU um, with, I, I was really thinking about um, time and how um, vast expanses of time could be interrupted. Um, and through these interruptions, it begins a new cycle and you and sort of the dust of the body becomes part of something else. So I, if we take something like a tree um, that takes you know, a long period of time for its, its environment to develop for the tree, maybe like 150 years for it to fully develop. Um, and when, it's, when it meets with the saw, it's, all of that time is sort of cut within a matter of seconds. And so, um, and then the dust particles re-enter the landscape. And so this, this cutting of time um, really uh, becomes sort of a type of violence, but also an opportunity for these materials to re-enter um, the land. And um, in a similar way, I, was, I also made this painting um, fall of my first semester. It's of a uh, aspen tree forest in Utah called Pando. This forest is one of the oldest forests on, on earth. It's millions of years old. Um, it's really unique because the aspen tree forest is all one organism. So all of the trees are identical to each other and um, they're fed from this basin below. Um, it's where they get their water from. And in recent years, um, years of continual drought have made it so instead of these trees sucking up water, what happens is that they suck up air bubbles. So you can imagine like a straw instead of sucking up water, it sucks an air bubble. And this air bubble shoots to the top of the tree. So you'll notice in this painting, um, the tops of these trees are dry. Um, it shoots to the top of the tree and the tree has a heart attack um, and dies from the top down. And so I was thinking about this as um, like a quick cutting moment um, that interrupts all of this time that it took for this forest to even come into being. Um, but maybe in a similar way, going back to this image, um, I, I had this experience before um, coming to school where I was looking at um, these trees that were backlit. And I was really interested in how um, like the, the leaves would sort of create imagery. Um, like there would, there would be sort of scenes of people um, interacting with each other, lifting things, kissing each other or animals like sniffing each other. And so um, maybe I didn't realize that at the time, but I was, these leaves become abstractions, but also um, sort of amorphous figures. 
um, to something that is that is somewhat permanent, um, but also becomes sort of a reflection of ourselves. So we begin to see like images of ourselves within the landscape. And so um, then for me, like when you begin to, when I begin to see these spaces disappear, it becomes almost like a di disappearance of the self. Um, and so in, in thinking about how images can exist within images, um, I was still thinking about like the extraction of natural materials. So for example, like the burning of oil is another example of this, um, this interruption in time. And this particular image, um, we have a landscape, a Utah, a Southern Utah landscape. Um, this is an oil mining field um, with a road with the oil leaking back into the landscape. But then in the back, um, I have this image of um, what is now the North American continent, but um, in its previous state when it was separated into like three or four different continents. Um, and then I overlaid this shell oil um, satellite map that, sh that shows where there are different accumulations of oil. And so I wanted to show this like um, deep time through this layering of maps. So sort of the pushing of land mass um, these mountains that are also formed from the, this pushing of land um, and how um, all of this time is interrupted through the mining of the oil and then how the oil re-enters the landscape in this really sort of perverse way and totally changes this landscape. Um, and at the time I was still um, really interested in oil painting as sort of a, a representation as a time based medium, a representation of time, sort of this like slow layering, maybe like geologic material. Um, but I also, I also wanted to express how um, in this, these interruptions, these materials are lively and they're, they're for like a tree is sort of cognizant or aware of its, of its chopping or even something like coal. So this is a portrait of coal, um, has sort of an awareness or a vibrancy. Um, and so I, I was thinking about this in terms of portraiture. So I have, I have this piece of coal um, and I wanted to sort of represent these, these moments in time to dramatize this sort of um, breaking moment. So there's a, I collected imagery of pre-Jurassic um, foliage. And then I was thinking about sort of the decomposition of all of this foliage, the fungi and the, the bacteria that would have um, decomposed all this material. And then it's hard to see in the photograph, but there's sort of this allusion to um, rock layers and then this sort of writhing and then burning of coal and then a re-entrance into the air or landscape. And um, this, this idea that a rock can be a portrait um, comes from Persian miniature. So I was, I was listening to a lecture um, by this Persian historian, Michael Berry. Um, he taught at Princeton for many years. And he, he talks about how um, in Persian miniature, if you look closely at the rocks, um, they become amorphous figures. And um, he explains this as being a metaphor for those who have closed themselves off to the divine. So um, they've sort of closed their eyes and their ears. And so their souls trapped in rocks, their demons trapped inside of rock. Um, and so I was thinking about, you know, A, making a portrait of something that is vibrant and living, but also what happens to um, rocks at an extraction site? Do they, do they get embedded with sort of a demon or um, like sort of our own demons in, into, the, into these spaces? And so this, this is an image of an open face coal mine. Um, and I, at this time, I was 
diving more and more into uh, using pastel. Um, I was really interested in how pastel can emulate um, geologic uh, material, but also exists almost like its own kind of a, a rock, um, but also how there's like this very particular kind of exchange, like sort of the oil of my hands um, mixing with the pastel and then the pastel mix, um, like rubs off on the paper and I rub off into the, onto the paper in some way. And so it becomes this sort of energy exchange that maybe is analogous to the ways we uh, impose on a landscape or our energy comes off onto the landscape. Um, and then I was also really interested in how pastel can um, present some of these elements. So things like cadmium or cobalt, which are also um, materials that are uh, byproducts that leak back into the landscape um, in coal mines. Um, this is an evil eye I made, still thinking about a port like a type of portraiture or something that look or a like a coal looking back at us. Um, so this is an image again of an open face coal mine. Um, and I was really interested in the evil eye as being an object that can look back and inflict almost a kind of revenge. Um, and then, so August of last year, Lucasa and I had our candidacy show at Rice River Center, um, where I presented this piece. This is also another evil eye, but I, we, I was thinking about the space um, as, so just a little bit of background. Um, Rice River Center is um, a space that was purchased by VCU and previously um, it was a marsh, um, but then it became a plantation. And then after being a plantation, it became a summer camp. And then um, it was acquired by VCU with the idea that the landscape would be restored to the marsh because the marsh would be cleaning the water. Um, and so I was thinking about all of these histories of the landscape and how perhaps the landscape looks back at us um, based off of these these ways that we've imposed on it or changed it. Um, so going going into fall semester, I was really trying to think about how how can I present these images within images? Um, and then also, how can I expand this idea past um, just extraction sites? So is there a way of thinking about the livelihood of rocks, um, maybe not necessarily thinking of them as like uh, demons trapped inside of rock, but maybe as uh, something that has um, like an intrinsic power. And, and so I, I began making these horizonless images of um, rocks that I was encountering. So this is a sedimentary rock that I found on a hike that really called to me um, because of its it was just presenting so many different images for me. Um, and around the same time, I was introduced to this book, um, Les Cultures de Pierre, which means the writing of stones um, by Roger Calois. And uh, what he talks about in this book is how rocks, because they present images to us, um, we're subject to their gravity. As they're subject to grab, like physical gravity of the earth, we're also subject to their gravity um, because they can, they can make images and it, it represents something unchanging for us. Um, and so I was really interested in how gravity could begin to like talk about the language of, of beauty and vibrancy within rocks. Um, and I also, I also really just love the title um, because the writing of it's the writing of stones, but also stone in French can be both a name and literally a stone. Um, and so both of the both this work and this work um, are are parsing out this idea of how how a rock. 
can attract us through um, the images represented within it. So uh, upon closer inspection of both of these images, you'll find multiple abstractions and faces and creatures um, all embedded within the rock. Um, and so I was, I really became intrigued with um, the Virginia cave systems. So it was explained to me that um, the mountains here in Virginia are like Swiss cheese. They're just like full of all these cave systems. So, um, and they're millions and millions of years old and they have these rocks within them that have been growing for millions of years. So they, they are sort of like growing and breathing um, but just on a different time scale as us. And so um, many of the caves I entered, I noticed there, there was um, a lot of extraction of stalactites and stalagmites, but also um, these caves have been repurposed over time. Um, and this particular image comes from Grand Caverns, Virginia, um, which has a long history, but um, one of its histories includes it being um, a hideout for Confederate um, soldiers. And so there was this one rock inside the cave that had all of these uh, Confederate soldier, soldier signatures carved into the rock. And when, when these signatures were carved, the area, those areas of the rock begin to sort of die. They don't, they, they don't grow anymore and it's sort of stunted um, and the rock begins to turn black. And so I, I was sort of thinking about this as a type of demon being embedded into the rock, um, how a touch, like the, the physical touching um, could embed the spirit into the rock and be trapped forever. Um, but also, I, I also wanted to um, talk about how these caves present so many images and make us feel the sort of timelessness and how it can show, um, yes, again, other creatures and um, something um, um, astronomical or, or um, even faces, recognizable faces. Um, so this is an image from Luray Caverns. And um, this image on the right is also another image from Luray Caverns. And you'll notice that these, that these cave images, they're not very dark. They have, they have a very bright palette. Um, and this is because these caves have to be lit. They're just sort of artificially lit. Um, and actually it's not very good for the cave. So this continual lighting um, allows for algae to grow, which also stunts the rock. Um, and so I was, I was thinking about how these, these little bubbles of algae begin to grow. And so then the rock is sort of like looking back at us with these little eyes. This is another image I did with this artificial lighting. Um, I remember distinctly when I was visiting this cave um, they called this like a hellhole. Um, and so I was thinking about it as a self-created hellhole. Um, and so that brings me to the work that I did for my thesis exhibition. Um, I think Holly mentioned at the beginning that uh, my thesis exhibition is not up yet, but it will be up next week. So if you are in Richmond or Richmond local, I would love to have you come see. Um, and this presentation is not showing all of the works, um, partially because um, some of the works are too big to photograph in my studio, um, but you can come see them next week. So Blast Zone um, is a series of images that I made of rocks um, at this mountain in Utah. Um, of this mountain in Utah called Topaz Mountain. Um, they, they're all images taken from this back amphitheater in a private mine, um, thus the name Blast Zone. These are images taken from the Blast Zone. Um, and one of the things I wanted to focus on these works was both how 
topaz has sort of intrinsic power, but also how um, we've imposed our own energy um, and destruction onto the space. Uh, so this first image is of a piece of rhyolite. So the whole mountain is made of rhyolite, which is intrusive igneous rock um, with, with little bits of topaz embedded within it. And sometimes there are like larger crystals. And so this, this piece of particular piece of rhyolite is an area in which um, over time, people have chill, chiseled out pieces of topaz. And so it's created these, again, sort of like a self-created hellhole. Um, this is another image from the blast zone. And you'll notice that uh, these images are, are very gray um, compared to previous images. I was, I was really into how um, rhyolite, which I have a piece of it right here, how rhyolite, even though it's gray, presents a whole um, chromatic range. And so that was sort of one of the challenges within this work is to think about how can gray present um, a whole chromatic range? How can rock can present multiple images? Um, and this is the last work I'm going to show you guys. And all of them um, are horizonless, so that you will you will come in closer and sort of expect inspect the drawings within drawings and imagery within imagery. And that is that is all for me. Thank you so much for letting me 